Warm greetings from CNS. Welcome everyone to this important webinar in the lead up to this year's World No Tobacco Day, which will be observed globally on the 31st of May, 2018. That is next, next week. Also, our governments are currently meeting in Geneva at the World Health Assembly to decide the agenda and the direction of the World Health Organization. It is no surprise that tobacco use being directly linked to so many life-threatening diseases and disabilities is indeed in the spotlight. The dream of a world we want where sustainable development becomes a reality for everyone, where no one is left behind, has no place for preventable epidemics caused by tobacco. The thematic focus of the 2018 World No Tobacco Day is on tobacco and heart disease. Cardiovascular diseases, or CVDs, as they are more commonly known as, kill more people than any other cause of death worldwide. And tobacco use and secondhand smoke exposure contribute to approximately 12% of all heart diseases, heart disease deaths. According to the WHO, tobacco use is the second leading cause of CVDs after high blood pressure. Undoubtedly, tobacco does break our heart. But despite known harms of tobacco to heart health and availability of solutions to reduce related diseases and deaths, knowledge among the public that tobacco is one of the leading causes of CBDs is dismally low. Our first World No Tobacco Day webinar today will focus on heart disease and tobacco. Our second World No Tobacco Day webinar is next week on 29th May, that is the next Tuesday, 1 p.m. Geneva time, and will focus on tobacco industry interference in health policy and why holding tobacco companies liable is so key for a better just world we envision. Do, just, do join us on 29th May also. Today's webinar is more special because we will take a moment to remember, feel, inspire, and celebrate the indomitable spirit and passion of a fearless and bold tobacco control leader, Yul Francisco Dorado. Yul was the Latin America Director of Corporate Accountability and a leader with Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals, or NAT, from Colombia. Perhaps one of the most inspired by Yul is Patty Lynn, who is the Executive Director of Corporate Accountability and a friend and mentor for so many of us. She is definitely one of those who is keeping the legacy of Yule alive, vibrant and fierce, and striving hard for a better world. Patty Lynn is online with us. Welcome, Patty, as we celebrate Yule's courage over the years in challenging injustices. Over to you, Patty. Thank you, Shoba. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here with you today. And, and thank you for allowing me to share a few thoughts as we dedicate this webinar to you, Francisco Dorado, who, who passed away unexpectedly just two years ago and was beloved to many of us in the global tobacco control and human rights community. Um, as, as Shoba said, I'm the executive director of corporate accountability and we're based in the US and we can globally stop transnational corporations from devastating democracy, trampling human rights and destroying our planet. And we believe that the life-threatening practices of global corporations like the tobacco, fast food, water, and fossil fuel industries build on a deadly legacy of colonialism and imperialism. And so we work in partnership with government and NGO allies, people's organizations and movements, our members, and the WHO to build a world where all people can thrive and I'm honored to join you today as World No Tobacco Day nears, as we work together to continue to stop the ravages of the tobacco epidemic driven by the tobacco industry and to build a world where the health and the humanity of all people are upheld and uplifted. Yul Francisco Dorado was a mentor and a dear friend to me, and I know he was to a number of people on this call as well. He had a beautiful and tender heart. He couldn't tolerate the suffering of people anywhere, and so he dedicated his life to improving the conditions of the world that so desperately need change. 
we at Corporate Accountability and the Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transactionals were honored to have you work with us for more than a decade. He had a brilliant mind and he conceptualized systemic solutions to the injustice he witnessed and worked with his colleagues to create plans to carry these solutions forward. He maintained a big vision for how we could improve the world together and he built deep and lasting relationships that helped us all know more deeply that we could achieve what seemed impossible together. And he became a leading force behind the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control with friends and allies across Colombia, Latin America, and the world. He was also a leading force behind Colombia's national tobacco control law, one of the strongest in the world, despite aggressive lobbying and intimidation by Philip Mars International and its allies. The FCTC was instrumental in shaping Colombia's tobacco control law, as it has been for many countries around the world. The Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is a very proud achievement for the global community, for all of us. It was adopted by the World Health Assembly 15 years ago this week, despite opposition and intimidation by the US government under the Bush administration at the time in the interest of the tobacco industry. It's a milestone for us to celebrate and emulate, especially in today's global political climate, where the US government is working aggressively to undermine and derail environmental and human rights protections in the US and globally in the interest of expanding corporate power and profits. For Yule, the FCTC was a powerful tool for so many things, public health, democracy, human rights, and corporate accountability. And today, as we work together to advance the FCTC globally, protecting COPs and national policy through Article 5.3 and holding the tobacco industry liable through Article 19, we pave the way for every necessary tobacco control and corporate accountability policy. And we advance health and justice in other arenas like the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change based on the FCTC's precedents. In the process, we build a global communi community dedicated to working together for health, democracy, and justice, as Yule was. Together, we carry on Yule's legacy of setting our sights high for what we need to accomplish together, speaking truth to power, building strong relationships toward the change we make in the world together and celebrating the beautiful things of life together in friendship and in solidarity. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join this morning and for all of your work for everybody on the call to advance health around the world. Thanks, Patty, for your inspiring words and thinking about Yule as we open the webinar today. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsarup. Ashok Ramsarup is a widely acclaimed international award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with over 40 years of rich experience in journalism. He was the senior producer at South African Broadcasting Corporation. Over to you, Ashok. Warm greetings from the port city of Durban in South Africa. The thematic focus of 2018 World No Tobacco Day is tobacco and heart disease. Cardiovascular diseases, CVDs, kill more people than any other cause of death worldwide. And tobacco use and secondhand smoke exposure contribute to approximately 12% of all heart disease deaths. Today, we have world's leading authorities on heart disease and stroke. Let me introduce our distinguished panelists today. Professor Rishi Sati is a renowned cardiologist from the Department of Cardiology at the King George's Medical University or KGMU in India and chairman of STEMI, Subspeciality Council of Cardiological Society of India. Professor Sati is also on the Scientific Committee of Asia Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology, an executive editor of Journal Heart India, as well as assistant editor of Indian Heart Journal. 
Professor Serti is joined by another world's leading voice on heart disease and stroke, Professor Pamela Naidu, who is the president of African Heart Network and Professor Extraordinaire, Stellenbosch University, and Extraordinaire Professor, University of Western Cape, Cape Town in South Africa. Professor Naidu is also the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Heart and Stroke Foundation. And last but not the least, we have Professor Ramakant among us, who is not only a well decorated surgeon, but also among the pioneers of tobacco control, especially tobacco cessation. He received the WHO Director General Award in 2005. He is a former president of, of Association of Surgeons of India, former vice president, SAARC Surgeons, former chief medical superintendent of KGMU, Welcome to all our panelists. Before we listen to our first panelist today, let me request you all to keep sending us your question, either by using the chat function or raising your virtual hand of the webinar too. Keep sending the questions while panelists present on CNS webinar. Well, it's over to you, Professor Rishi Serti. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Ram Saroob. Um, I hope uh, all of you can hear me. Uh, I, as already introduced, I'm working uh, as a professor of cardiology in King George's Medical University. And um, can I have my first slide up, please? Uh, so thank you. Uh, I believe that on 31st of May this year, we will be celebrating the world. Uh, can I have the previous slide, please? Uh, thank you. So on 31st of May this year, we will be having, we will be celebrating the World No Tobacco Day. And I believe it is very pertinent that this year, WHO has chosen the theme of World No Tobacco Day as Tobacco Breaks Heart. It is pertinent because, um, and uh, close to my uh, area of speciality is that every day I'm seeing and we all are seeing that tobacco is causing and havoc on cardiovascular health and cardiovascular um, health. Uh, the deterioration in cardiovascular health is one of the most important causes of global mortality. So I believe that among all its a spectrum of causing hurt to our body is the cardiovascular health where tobacco unleashes its maximum terror. So focusing ourselves on tobacco related cardiovascular diseases is something that is very, very important cry of the day. And I thank WHO for bringing the focus uh, on cardiovascular diseases. Next slide, please. Well, almost, uh, we all know that almost a billion men and 250 million women use tobacco currently. And what adds to these woes is that up to 80% of world smokers live in low and middle e income countries. Globally, around 6 million deaths occur annually, which can be attributed to, card to tobacco use. And, uh, you know, half of the long term smokers will die of tobacco related diseases and heart diseases, cardiovascular diseases, myocardial infarctions, and strokes are the leading causes of death among smokers. So um, that's what, uh, that is what the, is the uh, area of our concern today. Can I have the next slide, please? The next slide, please. So in this slide, we can, we can clearly see that uh, it demonstrates that the percentage of adult male who smoke daily, you have most of the Eastern European countries, uh, China and Southeast Asian countries, you have very high incidence of smoking among adult males. India in this particular, uh, in this particular figure is labeled as somewhere around 20% adults who, males who smoke. But we also have to remember that a vast majority, can we come to the previous slide, please? Can we come to the previous? Yeah, thank you. 
So uh, in this slide, I mean, the India is shown in the area of around 20% adult males who are smokers, but we also have to believe in, the, in many of the Southeast Asian countries, and especially in India, uh, uh, the form of tobacco consumption is not only cigarette smoking, but it's also the oral tobacco. So I think overall um, the effect of the ill effects of tobacco are a combination of smoking as well as uh, the oral tobacco consumption. Can I have the next slide? As according to the statistics of 2015-2016, up to 20.4% of all adult males above 15 years of age in India are smokers, and tobacco-related deaths account for around 13% of all deaths happening in the year 2016 in Indian males. Next slide, please. In Indian females, if you see the, uh, the data, it's around 2% of adult Indian uh, women are smokers and around 5.3% of all deaths in adult Indian females can be attributed to tobacco-related disorders. So tobacco is clearly killing around 12,000 males and around 4,500 uh, women every week in India. Next slide, please. As far as the overall production, there were around 7,20,000 metric tons of tobacco that's produced in the year 2015, which accounted for around 0.25% of all agricultural produced. And the data states that there were around 82.12 billion cigarettes that were produced in India in the year 2016. Next slide, please. Well, as mentioned previously, uh, the theme of WHO World No Tobacco Day is smoking and heart diseases. Next slide, please. Because if you take a look at the projections in India, uh, we see that all the cardiovascular deaths, that's the myocardial infarctions, cerebrovascular deaths, will actually contribute to around 41%, 41 41.8% of all deaths uh, in the year 2020. So, you know, the, the data is varied. The WHO data states that up to 25% of all global mortality will happen in 2025 with cardiovascular diseases. They are, the, the data is varied, but anywhere between a 25 to 40% of all humanity, uh, especially in the Southeast Asian, higher in the Southeast Asian country, will die of cardiovascular diseases in time to come. And we know that cardiovascular among cardiovascular diseases, uh, you know, the four pillars on which all cardiovascular diseases rest are uh, smoking, and apart from smoking, you have diabetes, hypertension, and this epidemia. While most of these disorders are actually partially or non-modifiable disorders that can be treated by giving medicines and only partially modifiable, it's the cigarette smoking or the tobacco consumption that is a completely modifiable um, and a completely completely something that we have brought upon of ourselves. So if we can control the other risk factors by our lifestyle changes and by medication, and if we can completely cut down on tobacco uses and smoking, then I believe that uh, a little bit of percentage change in this particular mortality will have a tremendous outcome on overall cardiovascular health and overall mortality in, in uh, globally as well as in countries countries of Southeast Asian uh, origin uh, people and also in India. So hitting on tobacco will bring down global mortality and cardiovascular mortality significantly in uh, uh, worldwide as well as in Southeast Asian countries in India. Next slide, please. If you take a look at this slide, you know, smokers clearly are at higher risk for all-cause death, for cardiovascular death, and from death from cancer-related issues, which is depicted in the lower panel. But if you see the difference between uh, those people who have never smoked or who are former smokers or who are current smokers, if you just compare the former smokers and current smokers, you see the, the graph separates pretty widely as you quit smoking. So when you quit smoking, your cardiovascular health comes down um, uh, improves on pretty faster than your overall malignant risk. The malignant risk also comes down, but the rate of fall of malignant, the curves would not separate so dramatically. So even if you are a former smoker, you will be at a little higher risk of malignant diseases. But if you have quit for a sufficient, quit smoking for a sufficiently long time, then your cardiovascular health tends to become, uh, you know, closer to somebody who has never smoked. So this is a reversible form. So 
people so discouraging smoking in and use of tobacco in those individuals who have not yet started and not yet onto it and asking the people who are already on tobacco and smoking to quit smoking would lead to a much better cardiovascular outcomes as compared to the respiratory and the malignant outcome of course those are also important but then the outcome the the effect would be much much more dramatic in uh, uh, in cardiovascular uh, arena and the cardiovascular arena is also killing most of the people so i believe the cost effect ratio of implementing preventive strategies is much much higher in cardiovascular disease so all focus has to be made so it has to be made uh, um, aware every smoker and the society has to be made aware that if you quit smoking even if you are a present smoker and if you quit smoking you can cardiovascular health it would tend to improve and get back to the level of non-smoker um, over the years. Next slide, please. So if you look at the mechanism of how tobacco affects cardiovascular health, and uh, if you see the cardiovascular health would cause inflammation of the blood vessels, it would activate clotting mechanisms, and both of which would lead to formation of thrombus in the coronary arteries and cerebral circulation leading to a myocardial infarctions or heart attack as we know in common language and brain ischemic brain strokes. It also leads to raise in the blood pressure and the blood pressure would, uh, the rise in blood pressure would also mean more peripheral vascular disease, more atherosclerosis um, in all the uh, in all the vessel beds. It leads to blood fat abnormalities, the cholesterol abnormalities, high blood catecholamines levels, and this would all be devastating for overall cardiovascular health. And it also causes what we know as weakening of vessels, vessel wall. Uh, the vessel wall tends to become ectatic, tend to become aneurysmal, and this leads to aneurysms of both in the major arteries, the aneurysms of iota, as well as in, in coronary artery disease. And the next slide is, is important. Can you come to the next slide, please? Now, what we have been observing uh, over past, and this is, this is still personal communication. We have still not published it, but we have a series of around 170 patients of, uh, of these kinds. And very soon, probably this year, we would be, end up, we would be ending uh, it into, um, into a very uh, somewhat uh, very revealing kind of a scientific publication. So what we were seeing in many of the adult Indian males that they were coming to us with acute coronary syndrome, acute thrombus in the heart, and when we used to see their coronary arteries, the coronary arteries used to have uh, the picture. If you see, this is the right coronary artery. On the left panel, what you see is the very smooth tube-like pulsatile artery, which is the right coronary artery, C-shaped, which is filled with contrast as of now. But on your left, uh, on, on your left panel, that is, it's a normal artery, and on your right panel, you see an artery that is dilated at some points, constricted at some points. It is aneurysmal. It is ectatic. The normal pulsatile flow of the muscle, because the muscle vascular wall is weak, so the normal pulsatile flow of the artery is not there. Blood flow sluggishly here, and the sluggish blood flow, according to the Birkow stride, is one of the leading causes of thrombosis. These vessels are more prone to angina. They are more prone to, because the vessel is not supplying blood at a very uh, efficient rate to the muscles, as well as more importantly, blood tends to clot in these vessels, causing acute thrombus formation, leading to myocardial infarctions, acute coronary syndrome. And when you do coronary artery, you know, the artery is flowing, but there's some thrombus here and there, and you just have to treat these arteries and medications. And when we did the retrospective case control study of uh, all these patients, I know they, they did not seem to have, they were all young individuals, they did not seem to have any significant risk factor for cardiovascular diseases in terms of diabetes, blood pressure, uh, and hypercholesterolemia. But one common thing here was the consumption of oral tobacco. They were not even related to smoking. So there was something in oral tobacco, maybe in the oral tobacco itself, or maybe in the composition of, you know, um, you know the composition they take in um, mixing it with various chemicals. These chemicals had some effect on these coronary arteries and oral tobacco. And nowadays, when we see so many of such patients, that whenever we see such a coronary artery all dilated and ectatic, 
we ask the patient, are you an oral tobacco consum consumer? And eight out of 10, the answer is yes. So we are in a process of publishing the series of around 170 patients. And this is something unique to oral tobacco that I wanted to bring to your notice. Next slide, please. So back in 2008, this was supposed to be my thesis. Uh, uh, you know, if we did a study in which we wanted to study those patients, many patients we were seeing uh, over the last 15 years were younger individuals, low socioeconomic. Generally, uh, coronary artery disease was related to affluence in all the time limit. Only yet rich, well-fed people used to have this kind of disease. But what we were seeing was that many of of the young individuals who were lean and thin, belonged to lower socioeconomic class, did not have conventional risk factors for coronary artery disease presented to us with acute coronary syndrome and heart attack. And we found out that inflammation was one of the risk factors for them. So this was the new risk factors that was explored like a 15, 10 to 15 years ago. And we did a study here in which we demonstrated low grade of inflammation by by uh, reading the studying the value of high sensitivity C-reactive protein and we found that and we classified all acute coronary syndromes uh, into their socioeconomic classes and we found out that this in lower socioeconomic class patients we had higher incidence of uh, C-reactive protein uh, and these, all, all these are patients of acute coronary syndrome so acute coronary syndrome uh, inflammation in lower social socioeconomic class patients was higher than other socioeconomic class and of all the coronary risk factors it was only smoking that was present in higher at, uh, in a higher frequency in this socioeconomic class patient so we gave a cause effect relationship that inflammation leads to uh, leads to higher rate of myocardial infarction in these patients, acute coronary syndromes in these patients, and probably smoking is one of the factors that is linked to that inflammation. And this study uh, won a couple of awards, including the CSI Travel Award for the Best, best Thesis and the A.V. Gandhi Award for, for young, young Investigators Award. So coming to the second hand smoke, the next slide, please. Uh, the 2016 data is that an estimate of one-fifth of all males and one-third of all females globally were exposed to secondhand smoke of their partners, of their colleagues, of, of, of general public. And there is significant data which suggests that it, it leads to sudden infant death syndrome when pregnant lady is exposed to secondhand smoke. It, it, is, uh, it is related to asthma in school age, impaired lung function, uh, lower respiratory tract illnesses, middle ear disease, including recurrent infection. It is also data to suggest that it is linked to coronary artery disease, lung cancers, uh, reproductive ill effects in women, uh, low birth weight in, uh, in children, you know, and stroke. And maybe, you know, breast cancer, atherosclerosis are also related to secondhand smoke. Now, there's something, next slide, please. Now, secondhand smoke, we all are aware, but there's something called this third-hand smoke, and it refers to the residues of tobacco and tobacco byproducts that solidify and forms and settle down in carpets and drapes and other surfaces in the room where smoking has occurred. And these residues also contains many harmful substances. So um, smoking in public places, smoking in places where, um, where children and females, especially pregnant females are present, uh, should be absolutely, absolutely banned. And this is something that we must also stress in our discussions. Next slide, please. Smoking cessation has led to uh, a better cardiovascular outcomes, this we all know. And next slide, please. In this report of the Sur Surgeon General uh, from the United States in 2014, uh, we found that reduction in smoking prevalence over the past 50 years in the United States um, from about half of men smoking and third of women smoking 50 years ago to around 20% of men smoking and 15% of uh, ladies smoking respectively has fallen down in this 15 years. This is probably one of, the, uh, one of the major factors contributing in the United States to the decline of cardiovascular diseases. Now, uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, the incidence is on a decline in the United States and two factors that has been clearly linked to this decline are a reduction in smoking and better control of hypertension uh, as following the various 
uh, JNC criteria, JNC guidelines that have been laid upon. So if if we control just the four major risk factors of uh, of uh, of cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and smoking, the smoking being a completely modifiable risk factors, then I believe. A significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality can happen and since cardiovascular mortality is the leading cause of global death up to 25% to 40% of all global deaths, I believe this is something that should be stressed again and again and there cannot be, you know, two, two words about it. Quitting smoking, next slide please. Quitting smoking provides immediate cardiovascular health benefits reducing of uh, recurrence risk for coronary events to that of non-smoker within three years and reducing mortality following a heart attack by half over three to five years. Next slide, please. Now, this is, uh, this is a pretty interesting observation. When you quit smoking over the next 20 to 20 minutes, your heart rate and your blood pressure drops. Uh, you, you start to feel better. Within 12 hours, your carbon monoxide, 12 hours, your carbon monoxide levels in blood drops to normal level. You know, two to 12 weeks, your overall circulation improves, your lung function improves. Over nine months, your, your coughing, your lower respiratory tract infections, your breathlessness improves. Over one year, your risk from coronary artery disease is about half that of a non-smoker. And, uh, you know, within 10 years, your risk of lung cancers fall to about half of that smoker. And your risk for around cancer from mouth, throat, and esophagus also significantly diseases, uh, decreases. Within 15 years, your if you have quit smoking long enough for 15 years, your overall health risk, except your probably your malignancy risk, comes down to almost to a non-smoker level. Next slide, please. Smoking cessations. Next slide, please. So smoking cessation benefits all smokers, regardless of age and amount of smoke. And next slide, please. WHO goal for 2025 is 30% reduction of smoking in each country and if we are able to meet that goal we would have 173 million fewer smokers we would prevent 38 million premature deaths from smoking and tobacco related issues and we would save a whopping 17 trillion dollars from um, uh, for from our health care cost the wheel of tobacco next next slide please this wheel of tobacco regulation is very important. We should start by somewhere around 11 o'clock position. Please notice there, the government have to uh, have guidelines to you know stop the the agricultural produce of tobacco leaf and tobacco related um, products. The farmers have to be incentivized and educated and retrained to to grow different crops. Then we next we have to move to a ban on manufacturing of tobacco related. Uh, products including flavoring of things by nicotine and tobacco uh, the packaging has to be you know packaging in many of the countries uh, is reaching uh, you know uh, uh, I mean tobacco industry is is fine tries to find uh, ways out of it but the packaging should contain a warning that is a deterrent to all tobacco users uh, the marketing of both direct as well as the surrogate marketing of all tobacco related products and cigarettes should be stopped and celebrities should be completely completely banned from endorsing such products you have taxation policies which could be altered to ask to so as to make tobacco consumption and smoking very costly for the person the point of purchase can be regulated where the tobacco products are not over the counter sale and care is taken so that young individuals, underage individuals uh, should not be sold tobacco and cigarettes. You have to have product uh, use guidelines where all workplaces and public places should be made uh, completely free of um, smoking and tobacco related activities and then the tobacco industry should be asked to bear the cost of cleaning up both the environment and going further paying up for the healthcare cost. I know this has been tried for long and uh, we have only been partially successful, but uh, that's the way to go about it. Next, and the last slide, please. Next slide. Uh, some of the countries are inspiration for us. These countries labeled as blue have achieved, you know, uh, all public places being completely smoke-free. This is an inspiration for other countries. I'm sure the other countries will follow suit. We all will join hand together and, and fight against the tobacco use and smoking and thereby bringing focus back on health. And uh, coming back to the WHO criteria, uh, next slide please, coming to the WHO's uh, 
uh, health related warning this year and our attention this year quitting smoking would lead to a better health outcome and especially for the cardiovascular health and uh, that's the way to go forward thank you for your kind attention thank you very much that was professor rishi serti for such an inspiring and informative presentation on heart disease especially in the context of india and asia pacific region too this is indeed the perfect stage to invite our next panelist who has contributed contributed to the fight against heart disease and stroke most notably in the african region it's now over to professor pamela naidu thank you so much uh, it's indeed a great honor to be a part of this panel and to have uh, primarily the african and asian region listening in and i see in the list of um, responses there's also some really nice sprinkling of listeners from uh, the west as well so um what i would like to do is basically take everybody through um the world no tobacco day but more from a public health perspective and obviously specifically from uh, an african perspective and i think that we're really fortunate in a way this year we could can kill two birds with one stone uh, given the fact that the theme for world no tobacco day this year is tobacco breaks hearts and clearly um, not only highlights uh, the dangers of tobacco for other disease conditions, but certainly puts an emphasis on cardiovascular disease. So just Professor, way may, I do, may, I, may I interrupt? You, yes. yes. Will, you please, uh, will you please share your screen? We can't see your slides. I think you're okay. not sharing your screen with us. Uh, can you see it now? Uh, Yes, we can see it now. Yes, we can see it now. Okay, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the interruption. Oh, not a problem at all. Okay, so um, by way of introduction and background, so tobacco control is, is really quite a complex entity. As you would have seen, um, if you view it from um, biomedical um, and a social and a psychological perspective, uh, it is very, very complex indeed, uh, particularly when you take into account industry as well in the whole mix of um, the dangers of tobacco. Um, the environment in which tobacco products are bought and sold is also rather complex. And work is certainly needed across sectors and stakeholders, including users who are largely addicted to tobacco products. So while the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control has been rather effective in protecting over 3.5 billion people from harm, and the global sales of cigarettes and other tobacco-related products are down, tobacco smoking remains one of the significant factors for the onset of heart disease, strokes, lung cancer, and resp uh, respiratory failure. Now, I think that directly linked to um, heart disease and or a stroke, so cardiovascular disease as a whole, smoking triples the risk of having a heart attack in particular and doubles the risk of having a stroke. Now, if one looks uh, from an, a health economics uh, point of view, it's quite staggering actually when you look at the figures. So the cost of treating tobacco amounts to about 2 trillion US dollars, which is 2% of the economic activity in the world. And for every person who dies, the tobacco industry actually makes a 10,000 US dollar profit per person who dies. That's quite staggering. Um, the environmental impact through tobacco farming is also hugely negative and very much like the um, sugar sweetened beverage industry, there's always the argument of if you know one over regulates tobacco, uh, people are going to lose jobs and so on. But I think that um, the cost of loss uh, at all levels is quite staggering. So, you know, that argument from industry really needs to be uh, stopped immediately because they're quite good at, at uh, delaying um, regulations as well. And sometimes they find the evidence, but, uh, you know, it's pretty much bought evidence in a way. 
So from a public health point of view, again, I would like to just very quickly take us through the epidemiological pattern of tobacco smoking globally. So one in eight million deaths are tobacco related. 7.1 million people died from smoking or passive cigarettes. Twice as many women die of exposure to secondhand smoke as men do. Uh, and in fact, these staggering statistics were launched. Uh, it was launched at the, uh, the local or the international uh, conference on tobacco, which was held in Cape Town, South Africa in March this year, where the, they launched the Tobacco Atlas um, at the conference. And I urge all of you to try and lay your hands on that on the Atlas. It's very, very informative. Um, and then an estimated 600,000 women died from secondhand smoke-related deaths in 2016. I think Prof. Sethi also um, highlighted that factor. Um, and then more men smoke worldwide, but many women get exposed to smoke from their partners within the household. Of course, you know, it, there isn't really scope in this uh, webinar, but I think that we need to interrogate uh, tobacco smoking from all angles, because clearly it is quite a gendered uh, topic as well. If you look specifically at the African region, Africa has certainly not escaped the devastating health effects of tobacco smoking. So in keeping with the increase in the prevalence of tobacco smoke in low and middle income countries, there has been an increase in the prevalence of tobacco smoking in many African countries. And in Sub-Sahara, there has been a 52% increase in cigarette consumption between 1980 and 2016. Clearly, it follows the pattern of perhaps even the food industry, where when it goes stale and is regulated in the West, then industry looks to Africa and Asia to make more profits. And that might explain the increase in the in cigarette consumption in Africa. If you um, continue to look at the African region, Lesotho in particular is a bit worrying. And if you look at the World Health Organization uh, country level data, it clearly shows that Lesotho is actually has one of the highest prevalence figures in Africa. Uh, and in Lesotho, we've seen a massive increase in smoking in the past decade from 15% in 2004 to 54% in two, uh, 2015. And this is due to aggressive marketing by tobacco companies and very weak laws and, and the regulatory framework is rather weak in Lesotho. In South Africa, we have seen a decline in prevalence and it currently sits at about 16.5%, uh, which is quite comparable to countries where there has been regulation for a while now. Um, I am based in, in Cape Town, which is one of, uh, it's in the Western Cape province of South Africa. It's one of nine provinces in the country. Uh, and uh, the evidence that's emerged from our province uh, is that we found that over a third of women, uh, that's 200 out of 584, in a particular township here, were exposed to passive smoking. It's a township called Mpigweni. Now, the Drakenstein Child Health Study, which is, I think, quite world famous right now because it looks at, uh, it's a longitudinal study that tracks from birth uh, up to five years. Um, and it looks at, obviously, various um, risk factors in a child's environment, envir you know, enabling and disabling factors, and the impact it has on overall health. Now, the Drakenstein Child Health Study found that the rate of passive smoking was due to overcrowding in informal settlements and more people sharing a room in a household. Now, this is quite a, a you know, quite a stark human rights issue. If one looks at the, the, the Convention for Human Rights, it falls right within the framework of the right of a child. Uh, it is so unacceptable that one in five South African babies surveyed in these two townships have the same level of nicotine in their system as active smokers. So out of 1,065 newborns, 18% of these little ones had traces of nicotine in their system. And we all know that nicotine is really the addictive uh, poisonous substance in um, you know, tobacco products. Now, these little infants are facing the consequences of high smoking rates 
amongst uh, pregnant women. And obviously the consequences include underweight and developing lung problems such as asthma. That's just a little pictorial. So it sounds really quite gloom and doom. However, I'm sure there are things, there are strategies in place which we all work towards. We, we can actually um, you know, achieve our end goal of tobacco cessation around the world. And I think that it can be done from various approaches. But given the fact that it's gendered, given the fact that lower socioeconomic communities are disproportionately affected, I think that it is about time we took a very serious human rights based, based approach to this. So I would then suggest that let's consider the influence of the tobacco industry on the individual and other social, environmental and physiological factors that drives the onset of tobacco smoking. Uh, interventions targeted at individuals, families and communities should be considered as fiduciary. In other words, we should actually be the gatekeepers as healthcare professionals, advocates and people in the health space. We should be really looking after the vulnerable. Uh, we should have control at all levels um, because this has a knock on uh, positive effect. This is indeed a good wake up call uh, if you look at the prevalence of smoking in Africa and the consequences of secondhand smoking, especially in, on women and children. And we, we need to recognize that smoking is not just an individual problem, but it is indeed a social one. Uh, what else can we do? So if we look at the regulatory framework, I think that um, government's commitment is really crucial. And of course, this week we see the World Health Assembly in action uh, and we're hoping that uh, you know governments would make a firm commitment uh, also towards um, the September meeting as well. But if you just take South Africa as a case example of how uh, you know South Africa has been quite progressive in its tobacco legislation, um, and I think it's a good case example for Africa and for the rest of the world. Um, so we've been fairly advanced with regulating tobacco uh, since 1993. Uh, in 1999, we had increased firm regulations around tobacco. In 1994, uh, we had the syntax instituted. Uh, so you're paying more per uh, cigarette and per packet of uh, cigarettes at the point of purchase. Uh, I'm very also happy to say you, you may be able to uh, access it on our government website. We currently have the draft tobacco legislation for public comment, uh, which is called the Control of Tobacco Products and Electronic Delivery Systems Bill. Uh, important to say that uh, we're clearly not supporting vaping and other gear strategies that the industry is using uh, to keep the profit margins high, vaping uh, being one of those products. Um, so while these regulations have effectively reduced the prevalence of uh, tobacco smoking, it's not adequate because I don't think that most countries in the world, I might say, uh, has the capacity for a monitoring and evaluation framework to ensure the implementations of the regulations and the level of adherence to the policy framework in order to be a game changer for, for behavior. You know, largely what we need is, is a population level um, influence for behavior change so that people just stop smoking. Uh, the World Health Organization has some really good tools. Uh, the Empower being one of those tools, which is completely aligned with the FCTC, which is a good guideline. And very quickly, the Empower is really about, the M is for monitor, so monitor tobacco use and prevention policies, um, protect, protect people from tobacco smoke, offer, offer help to quit tobacco, warn, warn about the dangers of tobacco, E for enforce, enforce bans on tobacco advertising, promotion and sponsorship, R for raise, raise taxes on tobacco. So in conclusion then, I think that all of us in the health space we can help facilitate uh, government's commitment to harm reduction through tobacco control policies, uh, through advocacy and other anti-tobacco agencies. Let's make an effort to keep domestic and public spaces smoke free. Let's mobilize to ban smoking outdoors as this contributes to environmental pollution 
and environmental tobacco smoke. Let's push the anti-tobacco agenda at the UN high-level meeting on NCDs in September 2018, um, which is very close to World um, Heart Day on 29... Uh, I'm sorry, it was meant to be 29 September. That's a typo error there. Um, so the, the, the targets, particularly for cardiovascular disease, as all of us in the cardiovascular space know, is that we are striving to achieve the 25 by 25, less than 25 agenda. And this is basically, um, we want a 25% in reduction of premature mortality and morbidity uh, by the year 2025, and particularly focused on the under 25s. And let's just align ourselves with goal three of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which states that countries should ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Um, and this year, the World No Tobacco Day theme, Tobacco Breaks Hearts, gives us more ammunition to achieve um, the 25 by 25, less than 25 target. So thank you very much indeed. Um, We'll, we'll discuss later. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Professor Pamela Naidu for sharing such an insightful uh, talk on heart disease as well as stroke and tobacco control in our African continent. I want to humbly apologize that Professor Ramakant is not able, is unable to join us as he is on his way back to India from Bhutan. Now it's now it's over to um, to our um, well that brings us to the end of our experts' presentation on CNS webinar. Now let us begin the open session. Participants, please keep sending your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand on the CNS webinar screen. It's over to you now, Madam uh, Shoba, Madam. Uh, thank you, Ashok. We now begin the open session or the question answer session. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Sophia Thomas, who is CNS correspondent from Bengaluru, India. Uh, Dr. Thomas, if you are there, would you like to ask your question yourself? Yes, please ask. Yes, please ask. I think there's a lot of disturbance coming from your end. Uh, so I will ask the question on her behalf. Uh, and this is very much related to what the Professor Sethi talked about chewing tobacco. Uh, Dr. Thomas says that a recent national report in India estimates that 70 million women consume smokeless tobacco to curb hunger while performing laborious work. And it is also considered culturally appropriate to consume chewing tobacco amongst women in many communities in India and may, maybe other uh, South Asian countries. Whereas cigarette smoking may be slightly less in women. The risk of developing CBDs in women consuming smokeless tobacco is two to four times higher than men. How then can we effectively tackle this long-standing cultural practice Pro, which promotes the use of chewing tobacco amongst Indian women. We have a similar question from Ashad Aruna Abdullah, Vice Chair of Tobacco Control Board Maldives, who wants to know the relationship between smokeless tobacco and cardiovascular diseases. Dr. Sethi, you had touched upon that, but would be pertinent for you to please re-emphasize a little bit and uh, satisfy Dr. Thomas's query also. Sure, sure. I think um, I think whenever um, globally, whenever uh, anti-tobacco campaigns have taken place, it's like we have stressed too much on anti-smoking, and uh, uh, it's absolutely true that smokeless forms of tobacco, the oral tobacco, are very, very widely prevalent in um, many um, states and many cultural uh, communities and cultural uh, and, and, and classes in India, whereas social smoke, uh, smoking may be considered a social taboo. I mean, the oral 
illegal tobacco consumption can be easily hidden. It is not so much considered a social taboo. And somehow people have not been uh, advised pretty well and have not been informed pretty well about uh, the adverse effects of oral tobacco. So oral tobacco is causing direct, direct effect on the oral health in terms of higher incidence of oral and mucosal cancers in that region. But even if we just uh, eliminate that factor, uh, although this particular area has not been scientifically studied well, but we see cases day in and day out, and the overall ill effects of tobacco are definite. Uh, than the uh, uh, just the oral oral ill health or oral malignancies, it is actually uh, much much more also in cardiovascular diseases. Uh, there's been no scientific data on that front, but oral tobacco affects cardiovascular health. Uh, uh, adversely and this has to be over emphasized and people have to be educated on that front and I believe we have to just have more policy in terms of patient society awareness about the ill effect of oral tobacco and rather than uh, quit smoking, we should be stressing on quit tobacco in whatever form it may be. Thank you very much. Uh, participants, please keep sending your questions using the chat function or raise, by raising your virtual hand, which you see on your webinar on the webinar screen. We have many more questions pertaining to chewing tobacco, which perhaps time may not permit us to take up today. But we will be sending the email addresses of of both our panelists. So. Ask it yourself if you're online. Any of our panelists like to answer that? Ms. Shoba, I completely didn't hear it. There's a terrible interference yes. on the line. I didn't hear the question. OK, the question is that uh, what efforts are CBD institutions dealing with CBDs, clinicians, and caregivers making to collaborate with first line stakeholders working against second hand smoke? Govind Kumar Tripathi is talking about uh, collaborating collaboration between uh, clinicians, caregivers, and stakeholders who are working against secondhand smoke. Can you hear me, Professor Naidu? Yes, I can. I can. Um, right. So I think that look, it's actually a really good question because the evidence shows that it has to be a multi-sectoral approach. Um, but it has to be done systematically. So, for example, um, you know, one effective way of doing this is uh, it's often government led, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, if one particular uh, organization or institution takes the lead or one uh, or a society uh, where you then hold perhaps like a round table to discuss how each of the, um, you know, the practitioners, uh, as the, or the clinicians, the public health specialists, 
campaign strategies, what money is government prepared to put into it. And I think now is the time to do it because it seems like globally, uh, you know, countries are very keen on, on firming up on their tobacco regulations. Uh, but it definitely has to be a multi-sectoral approach. I think clinicians have a role to play as uh, frontline healthcare workers. So, you know, without sort of sounding like a preacher, but I think to be able to give your patients, uh, empower your patients to contact local societies uh, or see a, um, a counselor, uh, you know, there are just many ways in which you can do it, but you have to do it uh, mobilized together at different societies and um, clinicians and public health workers and policy makers and so on. Uh, and, you know, um, societies have to be committed. It's like the way in which, you know, the hypertension group in South Africa is a very, you know, has a very loud voice for hypertension. Similarly, I think um, in the cardiology societies and other, other institutions, uh, I think the voice uh, not just of the uh, civic society voice, but I think uh, from the medical practitioners, there has to be a louder voice as well. Uh, thank you. We have another question for you, Professor Naidu. Uh, Ashat Aruna Abdullah wants to know, does South Africa have regulations for 100% smoke-free uh, smoke public places? If so, how much has it helped to reduce secondhand smoke exposure? and any reduction in smoking or increase in quitting of smoking? Yes, I think that uh, there's quite a few indicators that um, have been mentioned and I, I, there isn't enough evidence, for example, to uh, look at the effects on secondhand smoking. But what I can say is the regulations, uh, that is the new bill that's been proposed, uh, which is going to more heavily regulate um, smoking in public spaces. At the moment, you can, but it's, I think it's you about 10 meters uh, from the building, away from you know, uh, the environment where there are other people in, in the environment, but there's no monitoring of it. So while the government has the political will, uh, it's uh, really about the implementation. People are not really adhering to the policies. Um, you have found, however, that a lot of indoor spaces, it's become very regulated. So you'll never find a restaurant, for example, allowing people to smoke indoors and so on. Um, it has definitely uh, made a difference. I think not only the regulations about smoking in public spaces, but combined with the uh, fiscal measures, so excise tax and sin tax and so on, it's definitely a combination of strategies. We have seen a decline in smoking prevalence. Um, the problem is in private spaces. So if you take the Drakenstein study, which was done in the Western Cape province in South Africa, uh, you know, these are in homes, you know, who go, you can't really regulate in a private home. So women don't really have the power to say to their partners or husbands, don't smoke indoors. It affects, you know, everybody, including the little ones. And uh, so that's where the problem lies really for passive smoking. And I would imagine across the Asia Pacific, it's going to be similar, uh, you know, gendered issues around trying to control tobacco smoking. Thank you. Uh, we have many questions around uh, electronic cigarettes and now the latest which has come in the marketing about I quit ordinary smoking uh, or the heaps as it is called. And many questions uh, around that. And Dr. Rakesh Gupta wants to know if electronic cigarettes are being regulated in South Africa, is there a proposal to ban them? And not only in South Africa, I would say elsewhere also. Then Larissa, from Jordan wants to know what is the is there any comparison uh, between the effect of cigarette smoking on CBDs and effect of electronic cigarette smoking on CBDs? Uh, also, another point which has come up is the smoking of she what we call hook. And uh, I would also like to know from Dr. Sethi if you have some of your patients who are users uh, electronic. Uh, cigarettes maybe it is too early to say but what is your take on electronic cigarettes i would like both the panelists to please address this prof seti can go first 
Okay, Dr. Seth, would you please? Okay, Dr. should Sethi, I start you... over? Because uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Sethi is still online. Yes, please, please Dr. Naidu. Yes. Okay, all right. Yes, yes. Yes, so, yes, yes. so just to answer the Dr. Sethi has to unmute himself and uh, yes, Dr. Um, Sethi has to unmute himself and Dr. Naidu you continue. Dr. Naidu, you continue. All and right. Dr. No. Sethi must uh, unmute himself. He is online. Oh, but you okay. continue, please. All right, sure. So um, what I would urge everyone to do is please take this uh, website address down, www.gpwonline.co.za. I'll repeat it quickly, www.gpwonline.co.za. And basically, what it uh, it will take you to the, the bill, the new proposed bill, which is Control of Tobacco Products and Electronic Delivery Systems Bill. So the, our Minister of Health is absolutely determined that this is going to be passed. And it, it's quite, uh, it definitely intensifies regulation around uh, uh, electronic products as well. So, and it would, uh, you know, the same would apply to cigarette smoking and to uh, electronic delivery systems. And I think we're going to be particularly hard on uh, sale for the under 18s. It's going to be more stringently monitored. And it's definitely um, following the Empower uh, recommendations by the World Health Organization around, uh, you know, uh, plain packaging, uh, banning advertising, uh, not making it uh, attractive to young people. Uh, so I, you definitely, you know, electronic cigarettes um, uh, are going to be more regulated. Prof, uh, Seti can talk a little bit more about the pathophysiology, but certainly from a public health point of view, uh, we do not uh, condone uh, vaping or any form of electronic cigarettes either, because a lot of the, you know, they, it might not have be top heavy on nicotine, but there is still nicotine and other poisonous substances in there. The evidence is still to come, but to, uh, to take a safer approach, we do follow the WHO, um, you know, guidelines, and we, the World Health Organization has not condoned electronic. Uh, cigarettes either or any form of vaping yeah so uh, am I audible y yes you are now yeah yeah so I think that I would completely agree with you from a public health point of view okay. we have to have uh, thank policies you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Seth, would you like to add something to that yeah yeah am I clear am I clear Shobhaji am I clear Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, yes but sometimes uh, the connection, ah, you are okay. clear now. Sometimes the connection is better. Okay. 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 So I believe from I would agree with agree with Dr. Naidu that from a public health perspective, we have to uh, have a complete uh, you know policies against the use of electronic cigarettes. Also, although the data is not so clear about its ill effects and what exactly are the ill effects and there's still some nicotine, there is some evolving data to suggest that that nicotine leads to an increase in the sympathetic drive, uh, it leads to more increase in the blood pressure, it leads to higher catecholamines level, there have been some studies to demonstrate its uh, relationship to insulin resistance, so overall it appears to have an adverse cardiovascular health uh, certainly and I believe from a public health perspective uh, we have to have an absolute no uh, and making them less attractive especially for young individuals and um, I believe the data would emerge over a period of time there's still it's some gray areas there uh, but uh, I and we, we do not have clear answers as of now but as of now we have to treat them uh, as an absolute no from a public health perspective point of view. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Sethi, I have a question for you. Uh, I believe yeah. you were actively involved with the making of the first ever national guidelines for heart disease. Uh, There's about two years ago for India. Uh, could yes, you yes. elaborate a little more? I, I'm curious to know, should different, uh, different countries have different guidelines? Do they have to be country specific? And does tobacco use figure in the guidelines uh, of our, our own national guidelines? 
So, uh, so guidelines that I was very actively involved was uh, with was uh, I was the main coordinator for the heart attack or the STEMI, the ST elevation MI guidelines. I believe the guidelines uh, need to be tweaked according to individual countries because uh, both the disease pattern uh, varies as well as your healthcare delivery systems varies from one country to another. So, as the basic treatment and the basic drugs and medications and procedure would remain the same but the protocol the cost effectiveness of those protocols and the ability to implement those protocols uh, to deep down sections of the society and country as a whole needs to be tweaked to uh, to the individual countries and of course I mean this was not the primary concern uh, in terms of because uh, smoking would be more associated with the overall guidelines for the cardiovascular health ours was the SD elevation guidelines but still both the primary and secondary prevention of heart attack of ST elevation MI, tobacco cessation uh, is a very, very important component and it did uh, figure in both our guidelines in both the primary prevention of myocardial infarction as well as the secondary prevention strategies of myocardial infarctions and that's for everybody uh, to see and read in the first national guidelines for ST elevation myocardial infarction. Uh, thank you. We have already overshot the time but more, more than 10 minutes. So I would want to wrap up with a few comments which have also come in between. The rest of the questions, as I said, uh, the participants can ask directly to the panelists over the email, email IDs which we will be sharing with them. Uh, now, Elizabeth uh, Gatumia, uh, the CEO of Kenyan Heart National Foundation, has said, I'm glad to know that this webinar has given the much deserved attention to the grave danger that tobacco use poses to the heart. I'm also glad that Professor Naidu was part of the panel. Then, Nuran Kadir from Heart and Stroke Foundation, South Africa, thanks CNS for organizing the webinar. She is, says, uh, we are joining hands in fighting the CVDs by educating the society about dangers of smoking. Udayar Khan, a journalist from Pakistan, says, I am glad to be part of this important webinar organized by CNS on the link between tobacco and CBDs that has killed so many people globally. Sri Raj, monitoring and evaluation officer at India's National Mental Health Program says, no more tobacco products, please. Kamal Rizvi, branch manager at Lucknow branch of Family Planning Association of India, wants smoking should not be done in public places at all. And Rajdev Chaturvedi, social worker from India, poses a very pertinent question. Why not totally ban tobacco, tobacco use for humanity? With this, we now come to the close of today's webinar. My sincere thanks to all our panelists for enriching us with their expert presentations on the importance of throwing out all forms of tobacco from our lives. We are grateful to our participants also for being patient, despite each overshooting the time, for listening patiently, and for their lively engagement with the webinar. Special thanks to the African Heart Network and the Heart and Stroke Foundation of South Africa for co-hosting this webinar with CNS. And last but not the least, thanks to Ashok Ramsarup for moderating the webinar. As you already know, the webinar gets streamed on YouTube and podcast links will be shared with you and made available in public domain very soon. And lest we forget, the World No Tobacco Day is on 31st May 2018 to remind us of the urgency to put in our energy and efforts and work together for a smokeless, tobacco-less society and make the dreams of stalwarts like you come true. Bye and have a good day. Goodbye. Bye.